Yeah. Okay, everyone, you're gonna click. Deborah Lawler says she's slow to get an end. She's uh, must be too, must be a lot of interest. That's right. So um, yeah, hi everyone. Th uh, thanks for joining. Um, so this is an unusual in that it's this is part one of a two part seminar, but the second part is on Thursday and is uh, hosted from Geneva. But Sandra will doubtless uh, tell you about that at the end. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to. Uh, to introduce Sandra Greenland, who uh, you know, no, needs no introduction, that's, the, that's what one says, uh, who's emeritus uh, professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Statistics at uh, UCLA. Uh, he's helpfully left an email address at the bottom for complaints or uh, comments uh, uh, and uh, discussion um, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, and he's gonna uh, talk to us about, this is part one, on advancing statistics reform Cognition and causation before prob probability and inference. So thanks uh, very much for joining us, Sander. Over to you. Okay. Well, uh, it, you notice the title's a little different uh, because I uh, put cognition in place of counting. This part is more about the cognition. I'll save the counting for the continuation on Thursday, which is through the University of Geneva. And that's uh, through a class there. Um, since that's a little more procedural and that's in bolts. But this is a collection. I have hundreds of slides from these presentations that I've given over the years. Some of you have seen a lot of these uh, evolving from uh, how to not lie with statistics, use descriptive imagery, not inference, need for cognitive science and causality, and statistics teaching and practice, statistics as a condemned building, plans for demolition and reconstruction. This is more in that last vein. And um, I will largely read off the slides with some extra stuff uh, so that, because I'm gonna go fast, I've got more slides than I could possibly cover even in this time. So to go down one, and uh, this is uh, uh, some of the overarching themes I'm gonna start with about, so you've heard the old one about science progresses funeral by funeral. Uh, the problem is that a statistics uh, authority is immortal. And uh, we have this, a rogue narrative about science uh, it progresses uh, by each generation challenging its ideas, the ideas of the predecessors, what they're taught, and discarding those that fail stringent empirical tests. Um, for example, geophysics finally gave up the notion that the continental uh, continents were fixed, and uh, that took a, quite a long time against severe resistance by prestigious elders who had made great discoveries uh, of themselves. Uh, and, but uh, the contrast is that statistics, uh, it seems to be impossible to gather uh, persuasive empirical evidence to get people to let go of what are clearly, if you want to call them failing paradigms or uh, failing uh, approaches to using statistics in research and society. So the result is statistics is decayed uh, by enshrining these traditional methodologies and then defending them by academic, mathematical, and philosophical fields. Um, of course, in, it's always known that in philosophy, uh, you could argue for anything uh, up to about the limit of maybe just short of flat earth. Uh, but if you realize that you can do the same with mathematics, uh, mathematics is uh, in uh, when you attempt to relate it to the real world, it becomes a large extent of philosophical exercise uh, in epistemology. And uh, so you can uh, do all kinds of gyrations. Um, and uh, going along with that, it underplays the harms uh, to public information, just like any um, industry vested interest underplays the harms that it's uh, preferred practices to do. Uh, here's the consequence of this kind of um, the traditional approaches to use of statistics. This isn't what statistics books necessarily teach, some do, but this is the consequence. Uh, there's a very nice recent uh, figure here and uh, Sweat and Cater. Um, they're looking at well, something that was actually in a, a earlier journal publication. They'd uh, looked at Medline abstracts, confidence intervals, and the reporting, and they, the Zwet and Cater converted them to Z values, and this is uh, what they got. Uh, this curve is not at really normal, not at all normal, really, and even though our eyes have a tendency to make it look that way at first, uh, but the um, thing that is sort of overlooked is that over 75% of these you impute uh, are above zero, even if you impute the missing ones, but look at how cratered 
the evidences, the data are, uh, and um, you could put this in by subtype. Most of you will know what's going on here. It's a uh, screening uh, publication by significance test or equivalent things like whether confidence interval overlaps the null. Um, so what we've had so far, what I've discussed is that we have these sanctification of cognitive biases. Uh, like nullism and dichotomania as scientific principles. Uh, so people do enshrine bad habits of thought as principles of thought, because uh, I, I, this is what I think is going on, uh, that they, they, once they get into a position of authority, they figure their success is evidence of what they habitually do, that what they habitually do must be the correct approach or what they've taught is the correct approach. And uh, so this leads to them turning into laws, things that trying to figure out rationales for bad habits um, and bad ways of thinking, which are to a large extent hardwired into us. Uh, we try and understand things, our limited ways of doing so include dichotomizing things. And then trying to think of just uh, trying to neglect things that we think are too small and treat them as if they don't exist. And uh, <clears throat> That it comes down to, and then it was reflected in treatment of mathematical frameworks as if they were physical realities, and that is reification, and neglect of human biases that, such as craving for certainty and finality. And these things have wrought at the core of statistics. Uh, as you just saw, the core of uh, statistics, that is facts published in the literature, has been uh, blown out. A solution is to reconstruct statistics as an in information science and not as a branch of probability theory, which is what current modern statistical theory is built around, with cognitive science and causality theory as its core components. Probability theory will be used constantly, just like calculus is used constantly in physics. But as any physicist knows, uh, physics is not calculus. Physics is about objects that they're studying and the mechanics to how they behave. And to paraphrase a definity on this problem of re, uh, reification, uh, this is just taking what he said a long time ago when I was a graduate student. Everything is based on distinctions which are themselves uncertain and vague. We translate those into terms of certainty only because of the logical formulation, which is based on idealizations and simplifications. Uh, or oversimplifications, I'd say. The latter are distorting factors that one should keep in mind and check continually. Yet the reverse often, he says, I say, no, usually happens. We lose sight of the original nature of the problem, fall in love with the idealization, and then blame reality for not conforming to it. Uh, to me, that epitomizes a lot of statistical theory that I've seen in my career. Uh, in the radical Bayesianism of DeFinetti, all probability is subjective, describing only properties of observers' minds. And uh, some people try and criticize this, and they did in DeFinetti's time by saying, well, there's quantum mechanics, the probability is real. Well, even today now, there's a movement in quantum mechanics called uh, cubism, which is based on taking DeFinetti's comments seriously uh, to describe con quantum laws. So I, that's a, a defense that doesn't hold up isn't empirically forced by quantum mechanics, let's put it that way. And that view, the idea that patterns are caused by chance is absurd. It's absurd as a causal statement about the world. Yet you find that kind of phraseology throughout statistics. Uh, rather, we seek causal explanations for recognized pattern by considering a highly non-random by selection of the few causal possibilities that are put forth as plausible. We then reify the residual infinitude of unconsidered causal explanations as combining into a metaphysical cause called chance. And um, DiPanetti and others have referred to this as sort of basically creating, like creating demons and wood fairies and so forth called chance. When in fact, what we really have is a uh, massive complex of causal effects that we just don't understand and they're myriad and maybe they add up in ways that look like distributions. You can generate normal distributions. The central limit of theorem applies even to deterministic random number generators. It doesn't require true randomness to operate um, and make it useful. This does not, none of this says probability is not useful, it's the opposite, but we have to understand what it's doing. It's expressing our information, not 
the properties out there. Radical Bayesian views are valuable, obviously, I think so, for recognizing the deceptive ideations enforced by the frequentist orthodoxy, which now falsely portrays itself as persecuted. I can't believe what's happening, how they did this now, despite controlling the most influential research outlets, uh, like JAMA, for example, in medicine. They are thus often dogmatically promoted as the answer by those as disgusted as I am with the orthodoxy. My response, however, is not to get trapped in another religion called Bayesianism. Rather, I've subscribed to the pluralist toolkit idea that multiple views and their tools are needed to avoid getting trapped in the deficiency of singular views, singular philosophies, and singular ways of approaching our problems. And here's uh, some hard questions that have many answers offered and no consensus. What distinguishes scientific Statistical inference from scientific inference, scientific inference from rational inference, rational inference from common sense, statistical scientific rational inference from statistical scientific rational decision, rational decision from rational behavior. I make this a list uh, because most of the things on this list are just casually equated in practice in statistical training, in statistical application, in statistical use and discussion of statistics and scientific papers. They just casually equate all these things. There are plenty of great fine applied statisticians out there that I admire uh, that are uh, trying to be clear by certainly about the distinction between statistical and scientific inference um, are often uh, most everybody's less clear on that distinction of either of those from rational inference and how those relate to what's called common sense, which is often, as we know, extremely misleading and sometimes not. The, uh, all these, and then there are people who actually seem to revel in confusing inference with decision. Um, <clears throat> but that's a long story. Inference is itself, I believe, a confusion of ideas and uh, decision is a much more sharp idea. All analyses should be viewed. Here's some of my responses. All analyses should be viewed as part of a vastly incomplete sensitivity analysis. All we're ever doing in the kind of fields I'm talking about, uh, uh, and soft sciences, health, medical sciences, social science, as far as I can see, uh, they should just be viewed as part of a, a sensitivity analysis. You did an analysis and presented it well. We know from uh, experiments where people have been given the same data set, different research teams, and they'll produce a whole plethora of different analyses. Those just this shows that you, what you're producing is one uh, doing a sensitivity analysis with one choice of the sensitivity parameters. The frequentist versus base controversy is a religious dispute that disappears under detailed logical analysis. Uh, a lot of people have expressed this in different ways. Um, I remember 30, over 30 years ago, uh, UCLA, uh, a math statistician, uh, practical one, saying this whole frequentist base thing is uh, so, um, <laughs> so 1950. I mean, it's just not a, a practical, a distinction if you're very into the application. The Voxian view is, uh, which was very clearly stated by 1980, is that Bayesian tools are for model building, frequentist tools are for model testing. I believe Donald Rubin uh, has promoted the same idea. Uh, and there are many other ways of combining them. They're just, it's like how, how do you use uh, screws and nails, screwdrivers and hammers? They're just different approaches to trying to extract information and see what's going on, detect patterns. Until recently, both schools failed to cover the essential causal contextual dimension from which their data model should be derived. I don't think most statistical training covers it still, and that's one of my hobby horses along with others like Judea Pearl, uh, Miguel Hernan, and so forth, that uh, causation is absolutely a critical dimension that both of these schools uh, do, uh, neglected, although actually a frequentist it turned out uh, got more into it. Uh, before the 1970s, uh, then uh, the people like Rubin, they got more into Bayesian side as well. So what unifies these inference concepts then? It's not probability, but causation. Uh, past causes what caused, uh, explains our, our observations, which is asking about physical mechanisms, not abstractions of their behavior, such as probabilities. Future effects, how will 
our actions affect the future, which is asking how to change the behavior of mechanisms such as actual event frequencies, not probability distributions. If you said, uh, if you talking about a probability distribution in some of these contexts, it's like going in and claiming to a bookie you want you they should be you should be paid uh, because you bet on the uh, winner on the loser, but that with a higher probability. It just doesn't make any sense. As an example, uh, what will be the effect of reforms? That's a question that is uh, worth asking. Well, and the answer is any reform that retains selective reporting based on study outcomes will distort the distribution of available outcomes relative to the total number of outcomes. And this, again, this picture, you can see it will, anything will distort it. Uh, so using significance levels to pick publication use as is, is a routine now it's, remains routine it was actually promoted during my time and uh, you can find editorials from 1990 where editors are saying you know we will enforce this um, and that results again in cratering of knowledge disfigurement so uh, let's go back to this what is inference a uh, dictionary example a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. The scientific inference is a complex but narrowly moderated judgment about reality based on this assumption. There's a logically coherent, objective, observer external reality that causes our perceptions according to discoverable laws. My perception and your perception are both affected by this reality, but it's obvious. Look around at how people disagree, including the highly technical people about what's going on. Uh, clearly, that we reality doesn't affect us and lead us to the same conclusions. There's many more inputs that are going into our perceptions, especially our biases, our prejudices, our values, our vested interests, whatever. And this, all that, everything else that goes into those creating those perceptions, uh, makes inference part of a cognitive science. Now, contrast scientific inference to what's currently called and has been throughout my career, statistical inference, in which in all formalisms, schools or tool, toolkits has become taking output from a data processing program, which is a learning algorithm, packaged software, and generating inferences via decontextualized rules, so-called inferences. It converts oversimplified models of the mechanisms generating the data, the causes of the data, the actual causes are the mechanisms into abstract probability distributions. Uh, this kind of distortions is encouraged by calling probability models used in data analysis, the mechanisms, the selection mechanism. You read things where they talk about selection mechanism, uh, treatment assignment mechanism, and then they're pointing to an equation. That's not the mechanism. The mechanism is what people were doing to assign people to treatment, which could involve all kinds of cheating and, um, <clears throat> and pass. There are many documented examples. The semantic void left here uh, leaves causal inferential errors, uh, it leaves them unnoticed, and facilitates deception, self-deception and deception of others. So the challenge here is that like medicine, Statistics is a technologic industry that has become a major source of harms as well as benefits. Successes have distracted the field from failures. There's been enormous successes, for example, in industrial quality control and other many other topics. I see plenty of them, but I'm not here. I see them extolled at length on, uh, without any with very limited airtime to all, talking about the failures in all the statistics newsletters. It's just an endless pan to all the wonder, wonders and wonderful successes of statistics. They're real, but they're only half the story. There's plenty of failures. Mathematics has distracted attention from hard real world problems uh, throughout my career, all the promotion, everything, status in statistics departments, and even in uh, the departments with which they interact, it's all based on mathematical publications, which is, uh, it's ridiculous. It, it distracts attention from hard real world, world problems, diverting methods, research and teaching into math that misleads when cognitive and reporting biases are operating. This is the norm in medicine, for example. And I, I'm hardly the first to complain about this. Box did towards the end of his career, wrote very explicitly uh, about the problem of the math, saying the mathematical tale has wagged the statistical dog for far too long. But another real problem, a real problem with the mathematical treatments is that competence and integrity 
are a core assumption. They're not stated there. They stay, oh, we assume normality or not or whatever. But what isn't stated is that there's an assumption that the user and everyone down the line are competent in the use and have an integrity to produce uh, full uh, disclosure of all the results. But those are constantly being compromised by human factors. And for social comfort though, science and statistics maintains an extreme valuation of, as used in criminal law in the United States, innocent until proven guilty. It's a defense wall around researchers and methodologists. And this is a not, in fact, the standard used, for example, in the, in the United US justice system for civil complaints. And this is, this, I'm talking about a civil complaint, damage to the public knowledge database done by statistics. It's a civil complaint there. It's based on so-called balance of probabilities. Is it more probable that uh, the uh, uh, defendant caused the harm alleged by the plaintiff? And that's uh, what I believe should be going on here in assessing statistics and its harms today. This approach by using the criminal uh, standard is like having an honor system for highways and no regulation of industry. So um, imagine uh, you know, it used to be the case that every time you violated a speeding law and got a ticket, you could demand a jury trial. That used, that used to be the case um, in California until they switched the categories. They got rid of that. It would just clog and just basically destroy the enforcement system. It ignores a vast historical experience that a large proportion of any population will operate with no regard for strangers or a greater good. And that goes for scientists as much as for lawyers, politicians, and special interest groups. What I was always shocked by having experience in uh, science is this uh, halo presumption that somehow scientists are motivated, more highly motivated than other people and other segments of so society, uh, not just police and lawyers and others that it's uh, standard to express some contempt for, but, uh, but uh, other people. It's absurd. I mean, scientists are just a bunch of humans and they operate uh, in uh, the variety of ways that people do from heroism, whistleblowing all the way to uh, cover-ups and uh, serving the, the uh, interests of protecting the guilty. Uh, that's what they do because people do that. Uh, now, there's why some call, this all of this is leading up to is why some call statistical science an oxymoron. Um, that's, uh, there's a journal called Statistical Science and a colleague of mine back when it started publication 35 years ago, uh, Charlie Poole said, I now believe, begin my collection of oxymoronic journal, statistical journal titles. Uh, in the US at least, uh, the statistical training is largely degenerated into obsession with statistical mathematics, treating inference as a primordial form of machine learning. Uh, even the simplest linear regression, I. I I think you should look at that as simple as uh, name and Pearson hypothesis testing decision procedure. Those are machine learning procedures. They're machine learning procedures on the level that tic-tac-toe is an example of a game. Um, they're uh, grotesquely simple as learning procedures, but they can be effective. Just like when you were a kid, tic-tac-toe could while away a little time with an opponent, even though there's a completely known, easily learned strategy for creating a draw every time or creating a win if your opponent misses one step. This is, a, this is what is going on. This is what is taught. When I see most regression textbooks I see are just explaining how to use different machine learners. And now in the machine learning literature, they talk about some things that we learned as regression methods, like penalized regression as statistical learning. And treated, it treated context, meaning, and valuation system this as if those were only abstract algorithmic inputs, prior distributions, loss functions, these uh, formulas in um, the stat textbooks, avoiding or caricaturing the translation of background information into those crucial inputs. It ignored or denigrated semantics in ordinary language, favoring instead deceptive jargon as sales jargon promising significance and confidence, even when studies could provide nothing close without extraordinary leaps of faith. Um, this uh, single studies in um, medicine, uh, medical health areas should never be taken as inspiring confidence. I don't care what they show. It took uh, dozens of studies in smoking and lung cancer where you're getting relative risk of 10 and 20 to 
uh, just to manage to convince the Surgeon General, for example, to take action. And this is in service of selling technical products and services based on dense formalisms, dense notation, and art of, most of all, artificial precision. It's one thing to give a p-value, for example, to uh, three significant digits in a textbook when you want to make sure the person can check the computation for themselves. But when you're talking about it, trying to talk about the subject matter of an article, it's absurd. It becomes absurd. It's the, the actual precision of our inferences are far more poor than anything that could be reflected in those numbers. And when we're dealing with products whose assumptions and dangers are beyond most users and consumers in soft sciences. That's just a fact of the matter. Uh, just like I don't know the details of what's inside uh, my cell phone, and, and I'm sure most of you don't uh, either. Uh, we can still use them, we can still use them effectively, but it takes a, a good documentation for us to really know how to do that and not end up doing something absurd or use Zoom and not do, end up doing something absurd like uh, leaving some clothes off when you're uh, in the conference. Uh, so all this, uh, this problem parallels of medical product sales. I've, I've witnessed uh, much of that in my time and it's, a, it's the same thing going on. It it's becomes product sales. The, the scientific community eagerly contributed to the degeneration of statistical science, just like the medical community contributed to the degeneration of, of medical practice in this country. Rules that were apparently successful for narrow automated environments induced destructive feedback loops in teaching and research. Students want explicit practice rules for memorization to ensure correct answers. Uh, they become you know, we become very nervous uh, if they had to um, write an essay for a statistics test. Instructors want ease of grading. Uh, they would not only be nervous, they would be overwhelmed at having 100 students and having to check their word answers. Researchers want rules for submitting acceptable reports. Uh, reviewers and editors want ease reviewing and, and reviewing and publication decisions. That's a major cause. Of, a lot of publication bias and a lot of defenses say, oh, well, the editors, what are they going to do without a rule? Well, uh, why that rule and uh, why rules based on outcomes when we know that they will just damage the literature? Why don't you use chicken entrails to make your decision? That would be less harmful. And the prevailing rules became especially popular and destructive via the enforced dichotomies. This dichotomy satisfy human drives for defend, definite conclusions. Uh, they apply even when the study, the real physical data generator is incapable of forcing such conclusions if critically scrutinized. Uh, pe some people are very good at selling their study results and I, I'm amazed at the, how they do that in the study reports. But again, no single study uh, would should be driving conclusions. Uh, the only conclusion that uh, is defensible is uh, maybe more research is needed, although Often that isn't justified in light of cost benefit considerations and other studies. People have written articles about that, either how even that conclusion, is, banal conclusion isn't justified often. So the, the degeneration of statistical science into a collection of mathematical skeletons left behind explication of and training in essential components of scientific inference. How causal networks and not probabilities produce data, inferences, and decision how cognitive biases, as well as procedural problems, enter those causal networks, how valuations, motivations, goals, or real costs and benefits affect cognition and are implicit in all methodologies. Reasoning motivated by financial stakes and commitment to past teaching and practice drive resistance to serious reform. Here's an example. Here's a common label I see on dairy products here. So the, the uh, manufacturer, the seller, puts milk from cows not treated with recombinant bovine uh, horm uh, hormones. These, that's what that means, RBST. And they are forced to put an asterisk at the lead of the sentence down to a footnote right immediately below it that says no significant difference has been shown between milk derived from cows treated with, R R with RBST and those not treated with RBST. Uh, yeah, so what we have here is a case where a special interest group has forced a statement of fact, which is that the cows were not treated with RBST. I mean, this is a statement of fact, assuming that this is being honestly reported. 
to be accompanied by a misleading technical claim to benefit that group, that group of all the dairy farmers who don't want to give up RBST treatment. This isn't a question of whether it causes really has an issue or not. This is a question of what this statement means. I'm sure a large proportion of you know what this means. Nothing. It means next to nothing. It only means that you can see the politics entering here, that this was probably some uh, tiny study that couldn't find a difference on a few parameters that the consumers wouldn't even think are relevant to their decision, like uh, the nutritional content. And uh, nobody, the whole issue wasn't that the nutritional content was altered, but that what about the hormone contents of the milk and not the RBST, maybe there isn't RBST itself in the milk, but the hormonal content of the milk itself had been changed. That's what's at issue. And uh, this is none of it, how they, and they're gonna be able to put this in the label. This was strictly, this is an example, a classic example of why some people are fighting very vociferously to retain statistical significance as a scientific criterion. It's an ugly fact. The main problems of p-values, which get mixed up in this uh, mess, will extend to any statistic because they stem from truth subverting, perverse incentives and cognitive biases, not from p-values. If it's already happened with confidence intervals, when I entered the field, there was a drumbeat uh, saying we might switch to confidence intervals, confidence intervals must report them. That is a good thing that had been, uh, there have been people like Yates back in 1951 saying we should be presenting interval estimates. Uh, but the idea was that this would uh, you know, address the problems of p-values. Of course, what happened was it actually uh, helped encourage this just dichotomaniac thinking by having looking at whether things were inside or outside the conference interval. It just didn't anticipate all the cognitive problems, all the use problems that would happen just as Fisher and Maiman didn't anticipate the use problems with their methodologies. I mean, you can't blame them for that. It was before they had any data to discuss, but now we have examples like that figure I showed. The perverse incentives create cognitive biases wishful thinking, mind projection, or some of the labels for them to see what the incentives dictate, like to see good coming from all this. These biases pervade reports in fields like medicine, where the defense, once a product is approved and out there in use, the defenses of it will be extraordinary. Perceptions are now manipulated to see incentives for positive reporting while ignoring incentives for negative reporting. By positive and negative, I'm use, misusing the terms, therefore, finding, claiming to have seen an association versus claiming to have not seen any association. The replication crisis is constantly portrayed as one of perverse incentives to make discoveries by searching out statistical significance, producing publication bias. And indeed, it does that. Lowering significant thresholds only increases the bias, and that is something that's not hard to work out logically why that would happen. Any selective publication based on outcomes, again, damages the goals of building complete unbiased public data repositories. And if that's your goal is to damage public data repositories, then definitely modern statistics is your uh, baby. Yet defense and promotion of significant selection continues unabated. Let's look, here we have it stated, uh, if the p-value for the effect is greater than the journal's threshold p-value, then the editor can immediately reject the paper. This isn't being stated sarcastically, this is just on Twitter. This is a direct quote, a real recommendation about whether a paper whether a paper is worth considering for publication. And was this Fisher in the 1920s? No. This is statistics today. Uh, statistical consultant, specifically a book called The War on Statistical Significance, just published. Extraordinary. Uh, here's the consequence of that. Again, uh, this figure blows a hole in what's available in the literature. And uh, now people uh, can go all over the board. There's a lot of subtleties in this figure, which uh, were not mentioned in this article. Um, one is how it's right skewed, how it's shifted upward. There's a, uh, it's, no, it's not really normal uh, at all. And um, the center of it, that bigger line in the, in the middle of the three is roughly where I guess the center might be if you could fill it in. But um, 
this at least indicates that there's a, there's a bunch of perhaps true positives mixed in with a lot of noise. And that's exactly what we expect in reality. Um, but let's talk about something more subtle, the uh, standard replication crisis, how it ignores instances of perverse incentives to find and report and negative results. That was the, that's the usual story only going on and on about uh, false positives, false positives, uh, almost like it turns into the devil lurking everywhere. Um, <clears throat> but what about false negatives that can be creative by upward p-hacking? upward p-hacking, uh, looking for p-values that get above that 0.05 threshold. The one thing you can't see in this is, unfortunately, because of the binning used here, it went from minus two to two, is that you can't see what's happening in that crucial 1.9 to two bin. Some of these could be fudging over to one side and some to the other. And notice the height of that bar there. It doesn't, we need a finer division to see, uh, get an idea of what might be going on there. Um, this happens when researchers, sponsors, and editors want to dismiss undesirable associations, or when replication failures or other challenges to an association are more publishable than mere replication. I've seen this a lot. Uh, once you get a few positive reports in the literature, the real publishable thing is not more of the same, but refuting the previous authors. That's, that's what gets you in more easily. Uh, or both of those things operating. And let's take a typical example. Uh, I've used this example over and over and people complain, why don't you switch? And I said, well, maybe when you see the detail I go, I go into it, this time you'll understand why I'm sticking to this example because you've seen it before. Now I'm gonna give you more details about it. And by the way, it's a rabbit hole that details go on and on and on and on through over 20 studies of this topic. Uh, and just in clinical epidemiological sort of studies alone, and that's not counting all the animal studies and uh, cellular studies, so lab studies. Um, and that's what's hidden, of course, in, in, these, in these reports. Um, so this is about at what would we would call, I would go SSRIs, uh, which are carefully not worded that way in the title, uh, to uh, an autism spectrum disorder in children. Uh, so here's the abstract. Look at that abstract for those who haven't seen it they've got basically a 1.6 from a cox model they report this that cox model and it goes from about this the uh, compat what i call a compatibility interval goes from 1.2 to 2.2 uh it, but then they go and do this thing this relatively this relatively new and unfamiliar method and it's really a collection of methods called inverse probability of treatment weighted high uh, dimensional propensity scoring the association was not significant. That's what they were not significant. They get basically the same point estimate, it goes up a tiny bit. And now the interval goes from one to 2.6. The P value, if you back computer from this, is 0 0.505. And there, how did they express this result in the conclusions? In utero exposure was not associated with autism spectrum disorder, is a 60% elevation as seen in the treated, or at least the putatively treated, is that no association? Well, this is how statistics can cognitively warp people's reporting. But in fact, this basically was forced on them by the editors, I do believe. Uh, articles decrying this sort of misreporting date, at least back to Carl Pears in 1906. Uh, look what he said uh, back then, the absence of significance relatively to the size of the samples is too often interpreted by the casual reader as a denial of all differentiation, and this may be disastrous. Um, he's saying, you know, that you can't, what's been said over and over again since uh, hundreds of articles and places, you should not be including no association, no difference from having a p-value that for whatever your, is bigger than whatever your cutoff is. And numeral others have repeated this caution for 115 years since. Why does this continue in such naked forms? Is it mere ignorance? Well, I say, no, it's forced by JAMA to protect industry against litigation. Let's see about this. If the, what they wanna do is block what they would consider improper usage of these results. Well, Brown et al cited in their own report the same increased risk in their own meta-analysis of four earlier cohorts that got essentially the same result, 1.7 uh, 
with uh, interval from 1.1 to 2.6, but they did not attempt to combine their new study with those studies. Why do you think? And they do not cite a 2016 meta-analysis of 16 cohort studies and five case control studies that came up with the same kind of elevation. Now, this is an association. This is not causation. Brown and all are very clear about that. And by the way, from all I could tell from the reading the study, it's a, it's a good study in epidemiologic terms, in terms of execution, design, execution, and even most of its reporting. It's just the conclusions that get that did get picked up by the press. That is the problem. And that's all done with intent. Why no discussion of a consistent association of 60 to 70% higher risk among the exposed? Well, it's because everyone was certain this highly replicated association was pure confounding. This is a causal idea. This is the, this is the pivotal element here in the reporting. This is how Medscape reported that study and two others that JAMA published at the same time. The use of antidepressants before and during pregnancy does not cause autism or ADHD. Notice the C word there. They're claiming on the basis of three reports, ignoring all the rest of the literature, including lab and animal studies and so forth. They're just saying it, uh, that it does not cause. They're just claiming it as a fact. Three studies demonstrate that antidepressant use in pregnant women is like, now they're saying likely not responsible, which is a Bayesian type of statement. Uh, and they're using frequent statistics for autistic spectrum disorders in children. And that the association was found in previous studies was likely due to confounding factors. Now that may be true. It may have been due to confounding factors, likely due to confounding factors. So the point I want to emphasize is that this is a causal claim. This is a claim that there are uh, shared causes that are completely responsible for the association, shared causes of the uh, use of SSRIs and uh, the uh, autism spectrum disorder in the child. I'm not arguing that's false at all. It may well be true, but this, these three studies are, are no basis alone, especially considering all the other literature out there that has to be integrated and used, considered to explain what's going on. You have to explain the whole literature, not just say, we're going to ignore everything else and just go with these three studies. But people do that because they don't have enough time or interest or motivation to be that complete. The dominant social bias, though, and this illustrates, is to, again, it's the talk as if uh, every, all the incentives are to discover rather than refute effects. Uh, I believe, I'd say this is, we've just seen an example where that uh, is the opposite of that. This meta bias is rampant in the replication crisis literature, which uncritically ignores differences in incentives across topics and authors. The Brown et al. example instead appears to involve CI hack, interval hacking by adjusting until the CI finally includes one, even though the adjustments beyond the initial model appear to be over adjustment. This is discussed in Modern Epidemiology, the textbook, inflating variants without removing bias. In other words, by throwing in adjustments that are, and you can see from the side size of that that, that 0.997 interval, anybody who has done real data analysis knows that you could change one observation or change one slight setting in the program. And in fact, I know this is true of this HDPS. You could change it and move that onto the other side of one. And in fact, in the next software update, they added precision improvements to that HDPS program that would have pulled that interval in now above one. Uh, so making claims like this, that there was no association, is just, it's, um, it's deception. And then there's outright suppression. Uh, am right at all, I am right at all, including Greenland and McShane, uh, used the Brown et al. example in their original version of that infamous 2019 nature commentary calling for an end to the usage of statistical significance and dichotomania while preserving p-values. The goal here is not to ban p-values. We keep getting misquoted, miscited, or hinted that we want to ban p-values. By no means, I'm a big defender of them for a long time now, I'm part of a larger movement to defend them and get them out of the dung heap of statistical significance. <laughs> nature demanded it not be used, that example not be used, because we do not need a Twitter war that nature is blaming mothers for their children, children's autism. This is the literal quotation of the statement we got back saying we have to remove that example, substitute another more bland one. Read what we actually wrote and ask who it seems to be blaming. Here's what we wrote. 
uh, the, well, who, if anybody's getting blamed here, it's the authors. Um, and I would also blame JAMA um, because we said most, because most values inside the confidence interval indicate a substantial risk increase, not a causal risk increase. That's bad wording, but an associational one because previous studies find interval centering on a 70% increase. The conclusion that there was no association is ludicrous. Bold added, no, well, that association is not causation. Uh, we're not saying it caused it. We're saying there's an association that needs to be explained uh, for the safety of patients uh, out of concern, out of caution. The same caution that we would be applying to any other medical treatment like COVID vaccines. The point is not to argue that prenatal SSRIs cause autism spectrum disorder. That's a gigantic topic, but rather that spin is the driver through the garden of forking paths, that wonderful phrase from uh, Gelman and uh, Loken. Um, I think it was Loken. Objective statistics are perceived, selected, and reported based on preferred causal stories and in high stakes settings, political and litigation concerns. Examples abound throughout health and medical science, and that should scare you. They're injecting value bias into their reporting the journals are, and the authors. Statistical training that pretends otherwise obscures and fosters this manipulation. Uh, the causal stories that we, researchers, reviewers, editors, want believed causally affects analysis choices and output interpretation. The result is that reports often function as lawyering for those stories. A major blind, source of blindness to this problem is pundits in statistics and meta-research neglecting their own cognitive and political biases and training deficiencies, as well as deficiencies of developers, instructors, users, and consumers of statistics. We all suffer from these problems. And pretending otherwise, the whole halo effect, choir boy effects, uh, expertise effect, um, delusions, and so forth uh, are rampant. And they're, are, they are contributing to this problem. And if we don't confront them in some way, I'm not saying I've got some grand solution for it, but I believe any solution has to start with recognizing, acknowledging, and talking about the problems. It's just like, I see a complete analogy here, with talking about issues of sexual function and sexual dysfunction. It wasn't until the 1980s that the New York Times allowed the use of the word penis in articles instead of male sexual organs. Uh, you couldn't even talk, you couldn't, in the 1950s when I was a kid, they couldn't say the word pregnant on TV. And as if we're going to deal with, how are we going to deal with reproductive health in a population if you can't even talk about pregnancy on you know, TV shows? Somebody had to be in that way and so forth. This is the same thing, same problem. We have to get these problems out and talked about in language that we can uh, see clearly what's going and acknowledge and start to get a handle on it and what we can do about it. An example of, of uh, these problems, the, the, the consequences of this are the endless expert promotion of randomized trials as a gold standard when they are no such thing due to, for example, the huge generalization bias that anybody familiar with these topics knows. It's due to the exclusion of high-risk patients for ethical and liabilities concerns. These are valid, reasonable ethical concerns. They don't want to put people at high risk in the trials because they're going to suffer liability and they may be hurting these people. Nobody knows enough about the treatment. That's why it's in trial. But once it gets approved from the trial, it goes out into the general population where all kinds of high-risk people are going to get treated. Uh, <clears throat> the numbers in the trials are too small. The trials are incredibly expensive generally. Per patient, the costs are staggering 100,000 times sometimes those of observational database studies. The number, so the numbers end up being too small and the follow-up too short to discern adverse effects, resulting in a non-significant result uh, reported as replication failure I constantly see it saying this was not this report of adverse events was not replicated in a randomized trial uh, and what does it mean it means that the randomized trial got p greater than 0.05 and why did it get p greater than 0.05 because the confidence intervals went all over the board because the, it was small it was tiny compared to the observational study it didn't settle anything it added a little bit of information and then there's hidden protocol violations, which have been documented repeatedly, and there's only a tip of an iceberg. We don't know about all the things that didn't get whistleblown, plus selective publication of, and reporting are rampant. And they're, they continue to be rationalized by sometimes by leading statisticians, not just consultants. Uh, yeah, 
here's here's an example from MedPage today, just last week. I see him constantly. <laughs> is so Friday, bait and switch in IBD trials, primary outcomes often go unreported or change midstream. Uh, analysis of 57 phase three trials with published results, and that may be just a selection. That is just a selection, it's not a full all the trials that were done, indicated that half either never reported at least one of the pre-specified primary outcomes or at least one was changed without explanation. Other studies have found many registered trials are never published despite stated intent and in fact, even obligation to the IRBs to do so. So the idea that, that what's out there in the literature as randomized trial evidence, the idea that that is anything other than cratered and biased in the way that other studies are, it's, it's just a sheer fantasy. It's nonsense, it's, it's absurd. And yet people still are promote randomized trials. EVM is a gold standard. It's not because we shouldn't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do or look at randomized trials, we should take seriously all the problems with them. And this all reflects, I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna finish up with this comment of that. Uh, this, is, I, this is an empirical fact, which is more or less some of the big leaders in cognitive science uh, over the, my lifetime have basically said, we're all stupid, if not corrupt, this is a, the human condition. Tversky said, my colleagues, they study artificial intelligence. Me, I study natural stupidity. And he said, whenever there is a simple error that most laymen fall for, there is always a slightly more sophisticated version of the same problem that experts fall for. For an example, p-value. What's the uh, misreading of it that we constantly make fun of and see in the uh, research reports? that the people treating it as if it's the probability of the null hypothesis. But what do I see all the time? In articles written by sophisticated statisticians, they talk often talk as if p-value is the probability that chance alone produced the association. In fact, you can find this in statistical textbooks. But chance alone is the null. If if the result you saw, the association was produced by chance alone, that's the same as saying that the null hypothesis is true. So to say that the probability of chance alone produced the association is the same as saying the p-value is the probability of the null, which we know is generally false, except in some extraordinarily special cases. Um, anyway, I've gotten 60% uh, uh, of the way through the slides I was gonna to cover today, but I guess I'll just save them for the next time. Uh, I've got hundreds of them, so. Anyway, uh, so I think I'm out of time, right, George? So uh, yeah, sixty percent uh, is good. Uh, so um, uh, we've got a, a, a couple of questions in the Q and A. But if people have got uh, questions, I think if you put your hands up, you can be unmuted, or you can put them in the Q and A. But I'll read out the ones in the Q and A. Um, the first is Pearl refers to David Hume's inquiry into human understanding. Should we be teaching philosophy to our students as, now, yes. uh, as we now teach them ethics? <laughs> well, one way to look at this is to say methods are philosophy, they're philosophy in action. And unfortunately, uh, I have not been impressed with most philosophers in their discussion of methods, but the one who impressed me the most was Fly Robin, who I happened to have for philosophy. And his, his what's his magnum opus, which he taught from in draft when, when I had it, was against method. And I wrote an article taking off from that title, Methods Are Philosophy. This is our, philo our philosophy on how to approach and interpret data. Um, and I say we need multiple methods, which is to say multiple philosophies. And we need to state our goals up front and then see people need to observe to see how, how closely we're adhering to those goals because everybody's going to state lofty goals of their research when in fact much research the goals are simply to prove a point that was foregone maybe in favor of their sponsor or in favor of the lawyers they're working for or whatever it is that's what the real goals of a lot of research is so uh, and uh, second one is uh can you explain a bit further what you mean by sensitivity analysis uh in the time allotted maybe not but uh only that sensitivity analysis is officially described usually as varying the model that you're using for the analysis or the assumptions being used in the analysis to see how the results change under explicit changes in particular assumptions. Um, that's a, 
huge topic I and many others have written about uh, and their books about and uh, it's it's hobbled by this what sometimes could be called the curse of dimensionality there are usually in these typical controversies like the one I discussed far too many dimensions of sensitivity to effectively systematically cover um, maybe that's a, a good topic for uh, to move into artificial intelligence and machine learning from there but uh, it's, a, it's a topic area of research but that's about it I mean it, you really you could look it up online and see what different answers you get by the way anything you look up online don't trust any single source you will get different definitions and different answers of p-value of everything uh, depending on the source you go to and that's why I always start with ordinary English dictionaries <laughs> Well, I have a, qu a question. So, so you mentioned Feyerabend. So, you know, Feyerabend's you know famous debate was with uh, Imre Lakatos, and Lakatos basically came up. Uh, you know, his 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 arguments against Feyerabend were that uh, uh, you just you use lots and lots of methods, and that, uh, you know Lakatos basically advanced what we now call you know inference to the best explanation or triangulation. You just use all the, all the approaches and you're, you're, they're, they're, all, they're not all likely to be wrong in the same way. Do, 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 you, do you think there's anything in Lakatos's uh, uh, Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, there, there's this general idea of epistemic pluralism. I advocate that. I think Lakatos is great up to the point. As usual, a lot of these writers are great in the criticism and going up to a point and then starting on, I, I will put myself in the same category, starting on a general overview of how we could change things probably for the better. The problem is then you now fall into the trap of appeal to certainty, inference to the best explanation. Oh, come on, that that then you're falling right back into the trap of wanting to find something to believe in instead of simply saying, we're going to make a bet on this, we're gonna make a decision, we're gonna hedge our bets and so forth, like any smart investor would, instead of being certain that Bitcoin is going to go to $100,000, uh, they're going to hedge their bets. You know, That's what we should be talking about. And that's where decision theory, including Bayesian decision theory really comes in. And then we've got a question. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> you're gonna to have to answer this, Sandy. You're gonna to have to spell fire up and I think it's, someone's asked, yeah. Oh, I was, oh, it's, oh, it's been replied in the, I was going to say, I think it's F-E-Y-E-R-A-B-N-D, -E -E and uh, Benji Wolf has replied. So it's, uh, so the famous debate is, there's a great book, which is uh, Feyerabend and Imre Lakatos, I-M-R-E, and then uh, L-A-K-A-T-O-S. It's a, a brilliant uh, exchange from about 40 or 50, 40 odd years ago. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, about, about, the, about the methods of, um, of science and uh, inference. So, uh, Fire Robin and Lakatos is who to look up. Uh, I'm glad that Benji answered that. So, um, <laughs> um, I think there's one more. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Benji says that he thinks that Fire Robin thought that he and Lakatos agreed in the end. So, there we go. <laughs> So, so, uh, so, do you just want to tell us where where to hear part two on uh, uh, on Thursday, Sander? You, you didn't advertise it. Well, it's going to be. Um, I think it's four p.m. This was four p.m. your time, right? Yeah. It's going to be four p.m. Geneva time, which uh, I guess is what three p.m. your time, at seven a.m. my time on Thursday. Uh, there's a I tweeted a Zoom link, and uh, hopefully that works. It's also like this, supposed to be recorded and posted for those who. I to sign off or want to watch at their leisure or um, download documentation to uh, harass me, whatever. They, it's, it's, it, that's the plan. And uh, I guess uh, I'll have to think about that. I'll continue with these slides and hopefully get on to some others that uh, get into more concrete proposals, what I think would be good things to try going forward. Uh, but you already saw one here, which is to stop. And this is not original to me. None of this is original to me. Uh, the idea that in determining what should be published, whether a study should be published, one thing that should not enter the decision is what its quote, quote unquote results were, whether that's a P passing a threshold, confidence interval, including the no, or any other criterion. Uh, um, it will create distortion if you do that. Now, there are some studies which will be so small and they would have 
uh, so much uncertainty that maybe you wouldn't want to publish. I could understand why JAMA would want to publish them, but they should be published someplace. And in these days of electronic publication, they should have no trouble. And they should go into some kind of repository where we can see them too. That sounds uh, a, a great place, uh, great place to end. Uh, yeah, uh, look, look for yourself or check for yourself has to be the answer, which involves making data available, which is possibly one of the uh, greatest enemies of, uh, of truth and science has been by protecting availability of data, because if data are available for everyone to look at, uh, it becomes rather more difficult to cheat, I think, it's an uh, oversimplification. Uh, that, that, yeah. that was that was brilliant, and um, uh, the, the the video for this will go up uh, probably tomorrow, and we'll put a link if people who, if people go on the IEU website and want to get the link for Thursdays. We'll put the link up on the uh, IEU um, website uh, uh, for the for the Thursday part two, and then we'll put the link up for part the video of part two if it's recorded it, when it's recorded.